All right. Hey guys, I promised you this in class. So here it is super long and tedious example of horizontal at rest earth pressure calculations for stratified soil with surcharge and groundwater table, basically the worst case scenario of the problems that we were talking about in class here. Okay, let's get started. Um, so we have a gravity wall. Um, we are asked to find the at rest resultant total force acting on the wall, given the soil conditions below. And remember, this is going to be per feet of wall. So we're, we're looking at just a little cross section here. Um, uh, the wall is coming in and out of your iPad or laptop or phone or Zoom or whatever you're watching this on. It, it's coming in and out of there. So what we have are the soil conditions below. Looks like we have two layers with varying um, with varying unit weights and then a saturated or groundwater table and then saturated conditions underneath that. And then note the active or at rest earth pressure coefficient. So we have 45.45 for the first layer. Um, and then the second layer is 0.33. And we're given the geo or geometry here with the thickness layers. We also have this surcharge, which makes things interesting. So this is 400 pounds per square foot acting at the surface. And this is going to be assumed to be felt through the entire depth of the profile of the wall. So we're not going to say that it diminishes with depth like we would for the two to one method or the boost and S method or anything like that. We're just going to take it uniformly with depth. So what we would do first, if you're doing this the tedious way, would be first finding the vertical effective stress. So we're, again, we start with 400 at the top since that's where this surcharge is. We can't forget that. And then as we work our way down, it'll be just like we're calculating our vertical effective stress. A oh, few things to note here. Remember, we're below the groundwater table. So below the groundwater table, we are using the submerged unit weight. The submerged unit weight is the saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of water. So since we're sticking around in US units here, that'll be 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Now, the reason we do this is because we are technically looking at the vertical intergranule stress. Again, we call this and we know it as effective stress, but this is really the vertical intergranule stress. So this is the stress that is causing, that is actually being um, released from the soil itself. So that's why we want to do the submerged unit weight. The weight, the unit weight of the water or the soil underwater is has a apparent lower density than it would if it was out of the water. So to find our horizontal effective stress, which is going to also be our horizontal intergranule stress. So this is going to be the soil, the stress pressing up against the wall due to the soil grains. We use this relationship, and this is where that K naught comes from. That at rest earth pressure coefficient. So the way we would find our horizontal intergranule stress from the soil or horizontal effective stress or horizontal lateral stress would be the multiplying the vertical stress by each respective at rest earth pressure coefficient. And we've talked about the different ways of finding those earth pressure coefficients in class, all the, the theories and the empirical equations and all that fun stuff. So we see an apparent change in horizontal at rest earth pressure coefficient. And we know that we would calculate this at these four points. You know, this is our vertical, so we're finding our horizontal as well. But the few things we need to uh, remember here is that the 400 pounds per square foot due to the surcharge acting on the surface, but what the point that we care about is the point directly below it. So it's still going to be affected by layer one. So we're still going to need to multiply this by the at rest earth pressure coefficient, because what we care about is a horizontal intergranule stress from the soil. So our up 400 pounds per square foot is going to be acting in layer one. Now at this transition point between K naught of 0.45 and K naught of 0.33, even though this looks like a discrete point, what we're going to do is take a point in layer one directly above it, as well as a point in layer two. So we're going to have a discontinuity in our profile here, since we have a stress acting in layer one as well in layer two. So we're zooming out and just assuming that that discontinuity 
happens at the same elevation. So we can start multiplying each one of our vertical effective stresses by the corresponding at rest earth pressure coefficient. And that's where we see this 0.33 change here. So we go from 560 to 411. And then at the bottom, we're in layer two. Um, we don't care about this green layer down here. So we don't have data for that. So we're at 608 here below. So the exact the profile would look something like this. Again, highlighting that discontinuity from layer two at the bottom. But what we can't forget also is the poor water pressure or the pressure from the water acting on the wall. So um, the pressure from the water, this follows just a gradient and that follows the unit weight of water since the pressure in the vertical direction of water is the same in the horizontal direction. There's no intergranule activity. There's no arching, all that fun stuff. There's no re reason to put a coefficient um, to change from vertical to effective stress. So what we need to find is the resultant total force. So this is the total area under both of these curves, since we have the soil grains pressing on the wall, as well as the water pressing on the wall. So in order to do that, we need to start taking areas. Um, you can either do trapezoids if you're good at finding the area of trapezoids, or you can find the triangles and just um, subdivide them into squares and triangles. Um, so I'm going to do that last technique here. So we see that we have these three squares that we can find the area of, and those are going to be resultant forces acting on the wall, as well as the three triangles and their resultant forces acting on the wall as well. And of course, we can't forget our water pressure as well. So the force acting from our hydrostatic water pressure. All right, so to actually calculate all these things, I'm going to throw it up in this top left corner here, um, we need to find the total force. So we're just going to have to calculate P1, 2, 3, all the way through 7, and then add and take the summation of those. I'll show P1 here and go through it. You can see this is uh, pounds per square foot is the um, stress. And then the height is 3 feet. So what we're left with is 540 pounds per foot which makes sense because this is a resultant force per linear foot of wall coming in and out of paper. And then we do the same for two and three, as well as four, five, and six. And note here for four, five, and six, we take the area of a triangle. So 0.5 or one half times the base times the height. So the height still three feet, five feet, 10 feet, respectively. Just took the units out just to, to clean it up a little bit. And then the bases, we need to subtract out and make sure we're only taking the respective bases of each individual triangle. So once we have all that, as well as our water pressure, and it's easy to forget that one, so make sure to include the, the force due to the water, we have the sum and we get our total force being 10,983 pounds per linear foot of wall. So wall coming in and out of the screen. Um, of course, geotechnical engineering, we would just say this is 11 kips per wall or per foot of wall, or you would throw a factor of safety on it um, to whatever your design standards are um, to bump up that value. So let's say the professor was super, super mean and wanted you to also find the location of this resultant force. So this is where the extra tedious section comes in. Um, so to find the, the resultant force, we need to use statics and specifically from statics, the summation of moments about a certain point on our wall. So we know that all of these forces that are acting on the wall have a resultant force that is some location away from my point, and that this point is at the bottom. And we're just gonna say this lo unknown location is Z. So we need this reference, this datum, or this reference point. So we'll first set this moment point. For me, I'm gonna use the bottom. You can use the top if you want. Just pick whichever one you know the math is easier for. And then we would have to find where each one of these individual forces intersect on this point. So this is all geometry and it's a pain and it's tedious, but it's, it's an important step here. So once we find where all of these points intersect on our wall, acting in the opposite direction, then we would find the summation of moments on our wall and know that this is equal to zero since everything shouldn't be moving. And then we would just solve for point Z. So let's do that here. So you can see P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, P7 acting in the same point here. Um, and then the resultant values for each. 
Now I'm going to skip all the fun geometry point, but you can see P1 is acting 16.5 feet away from the bottom of our wall. And then I calculated each one separately, um, knowing that the resultant force from a square is acting in the center of the square and the resultant force from a triangle is acting one third the height of that triangle from the bottom. So from the fat end of the triangle. So that's how we got all of these here. You can check my work. There's a good chance I could be wrong, but the theory is there at least to, to follow it for understanding. So we have all of these forces from the soil and from the water acting in one direction. And then the weight of the wall and all that should be acting in the other direction. So that's our total force acting at a point Z. So we know that due to statics, all of these must equal each other. Since this is our resultant force, we need to find it this value Z. So this is where you'd solve it in your calculator if you're crazy, or you would use MATLAB or Excel in some way that at least you can check your math and it'll automatically calculate for you because you could easily see how just moving the decimal point one over or forgetting a one here will screw up your entire work. So just double check your answers or use a solving platform um, that would ensure that your math errors are, are minimized. So solve for this and what we get is a Z of 9.38 feet from the bottom. So nice and easy. So maybe not as bad as, as it uh, looks, just a lot of tedious math and a lot of tedious geometry, but then it's all static stuff we should know. So that is it. Good luck, guys. Hope this was informative. Let me know if you have any questions. Be happy to answer and uh, make sure to watch the video for the next class in lecture. All right.